professor at Yale Law School. During that time, Pam Carlin was my student. I got to know her really well and saw firsthand that she had a rare combination of skills. She had this wide range of interests, including how to do some good in the world through public interest litigation. That's who she was then, and it sort of prefigures who she is now. As my former student, she makes me feel so proud, and I feel as if there's a great chain here of people helping people, women helping women, her scholarship, her litigation, her government service, her teaching, her enormous generosity. All of that is trailblazing and is helping to make the world a better place. I know Pam, beginning, I believe it was, in the summer of 2012, when I asked her to come in as my co-counsel on the United States v. Windsor case. She was my co-counsel in every respect, in the sense that not a single decision was made without Pam and I making it together. She uh, deserves as much credit for our success at the Supreme Court as I do. So my initial reaction for being Pam, I'm quite confident it's the initial reaction that almost anyone has when they meet Pam. And that is that I was in the presence of one of the most formidable intellects of our time. It's not that common to find someone who is not only that brutally smart, but is also equally as kind. She also has enormous, unparalleled bravery whether it's in the area of voting rights or whether it's in the area of equal dignity for LGBTQ plus people. The promise of the Bill of Rights is something that Pam has devoted her entire life to, probably to greater effect than almost anyone. I used to sneak into the back of law school classes when I was an undergrad at Stanford and she was teaching a criminal procedure class. And I just remember being so deeply impressed you know, I've never met anyone quite like Pam. She's wildly funny in this mischievous way that I absolutely delight in. And she's also one of the most deeply kind and thoughtful people I've ever met. Thoughtful not just about law, but about everything. About people, about poetry, about how we can make a better society. Pam is devoted on all fronts. She didn't choose between the classroom and the courtroom. Pam's entire career has been fighting for equity, whether it's equity for people of color, equity for LGBTQ people. Her work in front of the Supreme Court, her work in the classroom, it's all about a deep devotion to equity. When I think of how I want to be in the world, Pam is the person I think of first. She's changed the world in so many ways. I think if you adopt the metaphor of the legal system as, you know, as an ecosystem, I think Pam would be something like, you know, a habitat. I think there's something to that description about Pam's system-wide role in supporting you know, the flora and fauna of the legal profession. The Supreme Court clinic she started has transformed clinical education and Supreme Court advocacy at the same time. But for me, I think it wasn't until I graduated from law school that I realized what and how much Pam does within Stanford is really only a very localized version of what she does more generally for the profession. And for me, when I think about the sort of specific habitat that she's most like, I think it ends up being the ocean. You know, she makes waves. And when it comes to floating, she's done most of the hard work for us. You know, the ocean is sort of this never ending source of inspiration. It certainly was for Mary Oliver, one of Pam's favorite poets. And one of her poem goes, I go down to the shore in the morning and depending on the hour, the waves are rolling in or moving out. And I say, oh, I am miserable. What should I do? And the ocean says in its lovely voice, excuse me, I have work to do. Thank you to the American Bar Association's Commission on Women in the Profession for including me among the recipients of the Margaret Brent Award. It is an honor beyond measure to find myself in a group with the two women for whom I worked after my first year in law school, Elaine Jones and Lonnie Gunier. No one could have had better models of how to be a civil rights lawyer than I have had. Indeed, if I were the kind of person to wear little rubber bracelets around my wrist, mine would read WWEALD. What would Elaine and Lonnie do? And it is an honor as well to find myself in a group with so many other women who've been so extraordinarily generous with their time and their example and their support, and most of all, their bracing criticism throughout my career. Whatever I have achieved has come because I've sat on the shoulders of giants. As I thought about what to say in the three minutes I would have left after thanking my mentors, my nominators, and my parents and my partner, I was struck with this thought. The two areas of law that have been 
closest to my heart throughout my legal career have been on starkly different trajectories. The year I clerked at the Supreme Court may have been the nadir of LGBT rights. The Supreme Court's decision in Bowers against Hardwick upheld a Georgia statute that made consensual same-sex intimacy a 20-year felony. But it may have been the high watermark of voting rights law. The court adopted an expansive construction of the newly amended Voting Rights Act that led to wholesale remaking of election systems around the country and enabled Black, Latino, and Native American voters to elect candidates of their choice to local and federal office. Today, things look quite different. Over the past 30 years, I've had the privilege to work on a series of cases where the Supreme Court decided in favor of equality for LGBT litigants, culminating in last term's decision in Bostock against Clayton County that employers cannot discriminate against workers for being lesbian, gay, bisexual, or transgender. I cannot think of an American legal movement that has succeeded in attaining such fundamental transformation so quickly. By contrast, the Supreme Court has become increasingly skeptical of voting rights claims. Consider June 2013. During the same week that the Supreme Court struck down the Defense of Marriage Act in the United States against Windsor, the court neutered a key provision of the Voting Rights Act in Shelby County against Holder. In this term, the Supreme Court issued a sharply divided decision restricting the remaining key provision of the act in Brnovich. So the lesson I've learned is to take nothing for granted. It's the lesson Frederick Douglass offered in his great speech of 1857, Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never did, and it never will. And if there is no struggle, there is no progress. As lawyers in civil rights cases, we have to be part of a larger movement. Technical virtuosity is never enough. Thus, I want, even more than thanking my teachers, my mentors, my colleagues, and my family, to thank my clients, people like Edie Windsor and Linda and Sam Whitfield, who've insisted on their rights even in the face of long odds. And I thank the women and men who came to court as witnesses to insist that their voices be heard. I think of the tremendous dignity of Ms. Sammy Louise Bates, whose powerful testimony about how she could not afford the fee for a birth certificate informed the district court's decision in the Texas voter ID case. So this brings me to the people I most want to thank today, my students and the young attorneys with whom I work. Einhold Niebuhr wrote that nothing that is worth doing can be achieved in our lifetime. Therefore, what we must be saved by hope. My fondest hope is that I will live both to see the United States become a nation where all citizens can cast a ballot and have that ballot counted in free and fair elections, and to see one of my students receive the Margaret Brent Award for vindicating rights we have not yet begun to dream about.